Okay, International Relations, podcast lecture number two, Liberalism. Liberalism is, together with uh, realism and um, Marxism, one of the three core theories that dominated IR uh, throughout the 20th century, or at least up to the 1990s. Um, Liberalism had, however, a very bumpy entrance into the field. As we've seen in the previous lecture, the first debate between realists on the one hand and liberals on the other uh, basically debunked liberalism for a form of idealism, um, starting out to studying the world how we would like it to be rather than what it really was like, etc., etc. And as a consequence, liberalism was basically written out of the canon of international relations uh, for several decades. Only in the 1960s and 70s was it able to return and make an impact on the field again, but only by adopting a very strong scientific and behavioralist approach to international politics. However, its core values um, have remained the same. Uh, intellectual background of liberalism started in the age of the Enlightenment, in the late 19th, 17th, uh, 17th century, when there was a whole range of political and economical, cultural and scientific changes in uh, Europe which gave a lot of contemporaries the sense that there were things changing from a period of darkness and violence uh, towards a more peaceful, scientific, reason and culturally advanced era. And at the core of, these mo of this liberal movement uh, were three main ideas. Individual freedom, reason, and progress. These three, reason, liberty, and progress, were not separated issues on the liberal agenda, but actually were understood to be mutually constitutive. Individual freedom, and the freedom to make your own choices, um, was seen as essential for the ability to be rational, to be within reason. Freedom to here, therefore, doesn't mean the freedom to actually do whatever you want, but rather the freedom to make the right choice, to be within reason, to be reasonable. Simultaneously, our ability to be rational is something that we need in order to preserve our freedom. So the two actually are two sides of the one coin. And in liberal thought, both contribute to progress. Progress seen as the sort of a longer term uh, development of human civilization towards something better. One of the early proponents of this liberal thought was uh, John Locke, who has been incredibly important, for instance, uh, for the United States Constitution. And for Locke, the state of nature, which we discussed last week in our uh, episode on realism, doesn't necessarily have to end in a Hobbesian state or violence or in a Leviathan that keeps us all violently in check. For Hobbes, we can actually rationally come together and find solutions for our shared problems. And one of the ways we can do that is actually by collectively delegating authority on leaders that we elect, and thus imposing on ourselves and on our leaders a social contract. By electing our leaders in this way, actually, we make them accountable for their decisions, and therefore we will be willing to grant them the authority that they need to make those decisions. So, for Locke, at the end of the day, um, the freedom of individuals that are able to make choices, 
and their reason, their ability to reason their way through puzzles, particularly collectively, can achieve progress in society. Not based on the goodness of man or some form of altruism, but actually based on reason, well calculated self interest. Another famous liberal thinker of the day um, was Immanuel Kant, whose essay Perpetual Peace has had a huge impact on international relations theories. Kant starts his argument by showing how human freedom and rationality can produce good governments, very much in line with John Locke's argument, and that an elected government will have to be accountable somehow to the people. Now Kant wonders in his essay about how this arrangement affects um, the dynamics of war and peace. And he starts looking at the ways in which um, accountability of a government affects the government's ability to go to war or produce a war. And his argument, very tentatively, is that governments may want war for all kinds of reasons, for the expansion of territory, for the glory of the state, etc., etc. But populations rarely share in those profits they have usually very little to gain from warfare and a lot to lose from it. Therefore, um, Kant suspects uh, or hints at um, it is much more unlikely for democratic states to actually go to war because those governments will have to be accountable to the population and the population generally will not want war. So, um, what he poses in his essay as a question is whether or in what ways democracies actually lead to the possibility of global peace. And this argument has been entered into IR um, under the name of the Democratic Peace Thesis. Like I mentioned in the opening uh, of this podcast, um, Liberalism lost the first debate, which wasn't very much of a debate, by the way, um, and was considered to be too idealistic to play in international relations scholarship. But this changed in the 1960s and 70s, particularly through the rise of behaviorist sciences. Science approaches that study the behavior of actors, be it humans or a group of actors, by making use of statistics, uh, computers, and forms of modeling, radical forms of modeling, particularly the rational choice uh, theory, and rational actor model. By being able to embrace these approaches towards science, liberalism was able to return um, to international relations in a very new jacket, so to say, borrowing a lot from economic theory, borrowing a lot from behavioral theory, uh, and trying to leave behind as much as possible all associations um, that were previously made with idealism. It should be noted, though, that Liberalism before the first debate was just as little idealist as it was in the 1970s. However, um, the old liberalism was much less explicitly scientific and behavioralist than its new um, alternative. So, when liberalism returned to IR, it came in three main flavors, so to say. Democratic peace research, which basically studies Kant's question of whether there is a strong correlation or a useful correlation between democracy on one hand and peace on the other. Interdependence theory, which studies the way in which trade affects war and peace, with the underlying idea 
that if countries are heavily trading with one another, the costs of war would rise, because it would also affect those trade relations. And the third flavor is institutionalism, which studies the impact of institutions uh, on the ability of states to cooperate and work together in the context of anarchy. Democratic peace theory um, has been taking place for over 50 years now. And most prominently, but certainly not exclusively, at the University of Michigan, where in the 1950s, J. David Singer, together with a number of um, collaborators, set up the Correlates of War program, or as we like to call it, the COW program. And the Correlates of War program is roughly a database. A database containing pretty much all variables having to do with war and peace since the early 19th century. So this database contains data on government types, on violent conflict, on years of peace, on trade, on all kinds of aspects having to do with war, peace and government of all countries in the world for almost 200 years. It should be noted, by the way, that this uh, database is freely accessible. So if you are interested in doing statistics uh, in international relations, you can actually use the data available to you in the Correlates of War program. Two things to be noted in, in democratic peace theory. First of all, that yes, there is a very strong correlation between democracy, free markets, and peace. These three seem to be hanging together very, very strongly. However, secondly, um, even though democratic peace thesis suggests that there is a correlation between democracy and peace, this certainly does not imply that democracies don't go to war. There is a very strong correlation between two democratic countries going to war. They rarely do so. Democracies, it has been found, almost never fight other democracies. However, democracies do fight non-democracies, or at least countries that they consider to be non-democracies. So, uh, on the one hand, the democratic peace uh, theory school has been able to confirm aspects of Kant's uh, perpetual peace thesis, but on the other hand, things are more complicated um, and uh, the studies are still evolving. Interdependence is a different school of IR liberalism that came up in the 1970s, particularly through Robert Keohane and Joseph Nye. And it was in itself nothing new. Uh, the liberalism that was available during the first debate had already been based on this idea of commercial peace, that if countries have a lot of trade between them, the cost of uh, going to war with one another will simply rise. Kiyohan and I uh, actually dust off this premise and uh, bring it back into international relations with a more modern and a more scientific um, approach, where they are taking interdependence um, as a growing set of arrangements that we now would call globalization. And they show how the costs of warfare are related with the growth of globalization. Once again, their analysis has nothing to do with um, the nature of government or uh, altruism in some form, but rather with a purely rational calculation of costs and benefits. And their point being that uh, under globalization, it is going to be much harder for states to actually start wars. The third school 
of higher liberalism is what is called institutionalism or neoliberal institutionalism, which basically studies the roles, the role of institutions and regimes in international relations. Institu institutions can be seen um, as a set of institutional practices that have been embedded uh, in all kind of local and non-local uh, forms of governance. So institutions are, for instance, the United Nations or the World Health Organization or the European Union, etc. Regimes are considered to be more like institutionalized forms of norms and values that countries have agreed upon to pursue together, but are much less firmly institutionalized than, for instance, the United Nations. So, for instance, the whaling ban um, is considered to be a regime, or the Kyoto Protocol. Neoliberal institutionalism studies the way in which institutions and regimes make cooperation easier for states by focusing particularly um, on the way that they provide states with transparency, predictability, better information, and durability. Roughly, the idea is that it is easier for states to step into an existing institution that already has rules for what is good behavior and bad behavior, clear sets of punishments for if states do not comply, um, st standards for what counts as good information, um, and the institutional strength to be durable. This will lower the transaction costs, as it argues, as it is argued, and make cooperation much easier than if, for instance, you would have to negotiate all those different aspects of politics with individual states uh, that you don't uh, know how to control, you don't know how they may be cheating, they, you don't know uh, if they're going to be predictable um, or how you would be able to punish them, for instance. So institutions and regimes help states to cooperate because they lower the costs of transaction. Simultaneously, um, they are not the solution for everything, even within institutions, and we've seen this, of course, within the European Union, for instance, with the case of Greece, there can be problems of cheating, of non-compliance, buck passing, uh, not trying, trying not to have to contribute to the public good that is being produced, uh, while uh, still profiting from it, etc. So, neoliberal institutionalists uh, thought um, several sub-branches of it show that institutional cooperation is possible but still difficult and studies the ways in which it can be uh, made more efficient and improved. In the 1990s we see something of a convergence between neorealism on the one hand which is basically um, the school of thought coming out of structural realism with Waltz's polarity um, and neoliberal theory. The two that were often considered to be very antagonistic start converging on a number of issues which has been labeled now um, the neo-neo debate. Both neorealism and neoliberalism accept the anarchic nature of the international, the need for security, and the role of power in politics. Right. Both of them also accept um, that politics is a rational endeavor and that states carefully uh, should weigh costs and benefits of each decision. They differ on relatively small things. Roughly, uh, the, the biggest thing is that they differ on their take of how much we can mitigate the effects of anarchy. Neorealists will maintain that anarchy cannot be 
softened substainably and considerably um, except in maybe short periods of calm but that in the end of the day um, anarchy will rear its ugly head again and will lead to new phases of competition liberalism neoliberalism is more optimistic here and sees considerable considerable um, opportunities for cooperation even though it acknowledges that this will not resolve all issues so in that sense it is something of a glass half full glass half empty discussion they also differ on the difference between absolute gains and relative gains liberals argue that states are relatively easily contended with having what they wanted right where neorealists uh, neo tend to argue that states are very suspicious of what other states are getting even if I get what I want if another state might be getting more than I get um, I will want to get more too so it's looking at relative gains rather than absolute gains and of course neorealists would focus much more on how much capability states have while neoliberals would emphasize how much institutional practices and arrangements help states to achieve their goals okay some questions to end this podcast with a key assumption of liberalism is that states always make rational choices that's an interesting assumption what would it mean for a state to make rational choices what do we mean with rationality do states really weigh all their options very carefully or are there circumstances in which their options are already sort of pre-given by certain constellations of values norms culture etc right if states are rational they would sort of open the door for states always to have also to be emotional could states have emotion well another question is that states in liberalism and also non-state actors are always free to make their own choices they're sort of free agents that have certain preferences and weigh them and then make their choice that's an interesting conceptual conceptualization of decision making how free are states how free are actors are we really able to do whatever we want in world politics or do we come to the world so to say already bound in all kinds of arrangements in all kinds of practices in all kinds of cultural um, habits etc how free are we thirdly democratic countries do not seem to make much war among themselves this seems to confirm Kant's analysis of how democracy actually affects uh, war and peace but it may not be the only explanation could there be other explanations of why democratic countries do not seem to be f fighting with each other very much would the only possible explanation be this liberal account of democracy what would the other accounts look like and finally in what kind of issues do inst international institutions actually work we seem to be um, relatively unhappy with the ability of the United Nations to resolve certain kinds of issues on the other hand institutions like the European Union um, are often criticized for being 
actually very effective for being effective in redistributing money flows uh, and providing all kinds of solutions that its contenders do not like. So what kind of issues are issues that institutions are able to deal well with? And what are the issues in which they actually perform weakly?